What's going on, everybody? I've got today, we're doing a community uh, kind of interview, and we're going to be talking with Luke from Master of the Fleet. So uh, let's go ahead, and we, we've got Luke with us today. How's it going? Howdy. Hi. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Master of the Fleet, uh, it, it's one of my favorite YouTube channels, specifically covering Armada and now also Legion. So uh, they have some of the, some really great strategy as well as a lot of really, really good bat reps. And I really like, um, you know, basically the, the way that they do them. They're very unique in that, you know, they have a, a unique approach. So I definitely uh, suggest you check them out. But tell us a little more about Masters of the Fleet. Yeah, so I mean, Master of the Fleet, we just uh, we just celebrated our two year anniversary this week, just gone. Um, Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. Um, it, look, it's been a really enjoyable experience. It's um, so pretty much it's something that me and some friends of mine, uh, Ken and Nick, started up. Um, and so when we started, we were purely focused on Armada because predominantly that was the main game we were playing, and we also thought. It was we thought there was a, a a gap in the battle report space that we could fill and you know, Definitely. be the change you want to see in the world. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so pretty much, I mean, really, Ken does all the hard work. I just appear in, on camera. He does all the editing and all of that stuff, and he's the one that provides all the beautiful, unique shots. Um, but, yeah, we just have a lot of fun. So, as you said, we do battle reports, we do strategy stuff, and we sort of go through all, you know, how we play the game and what we think are good strategies for both beginners and advanced players and, you pick up a lot just watching us play. So. I think so. I think I, I really like the the camera angles too. It's one of the things I think is unique. Um, you know, a, a lot of people. I I do battle reports as well, but I've only ever done static camera. And then I, after watching some of yours, I've tried to like kind of hold the camera in and you know just do kind of like highlights. But but it's it's like you guys you know have each other like holding the camera for each every time you're doing stuff the other person mm -hmm. holds so you really you get all the angles you get you know you get so much more um you know without you know and, and you feel more involved i think and that's something i i really kind of like is that um you know you're able to see it from your opponent's point of view and from your point of view at the same time so i mean how do you do you ever go back and watch your own battle reports uh, I do. I mean, like straight off, that sounds really like narcissistic, like, oh, yes, we've done a great job. Oh, killed it, this video. <laughs> no, but I do like to go back and look at it because I think it's a good way to sort of learn uh, from our mistakes. There'll be sometimes yeah. you're like, wow, we did that really poorly or we did this really well. But then also it's kind of, as you say, it's um, because Ken is normally the one holding the camera and really the takeaway should be that Ken is the hero of the channel. Um, <laughs> But he gets a real unique viewpoint, as you say, and even as the person playing in the battle report, oftentimes mm. it's really fun to go back and watch it because you get to see how Ken saw it and you get to see all these really great angles that he's pulled off. And you might even see stuff that you totally missed too, which is, is always kind of, you know, like, oh, I, that, that person rolled a couple of blanks and I think he changed that die. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately that's never happened. But it definitely has, I've unfortunately seen a lot of times where I'm like, why did I make this stupid decision? And mm. it's all captured on film, and you're like, "Well, that's awful. I played awful." <laughs> it's yeah, that has happened to me. That has happened to me before as well. And it's it, it's it's funny seeing the things where like, where did I go wrong? And coming back to see exactly where where the screw up was made. Um, and another thing that you guys do beyond just regular battle reports is you 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 guys do these custom scenarios. So like one of the most recent ones that I was really blown away by, you did this Battle of Adalon. Um, tell me how much work went into to doing something that big. Um, that was that was a lot of work. That because uh, you know, like most content producers, we're doing this alongside our day jobs and our Absolutely. other hobbies. Um, so that was a really late night, and I think work the next day for all of us was awful, just absolutely <laughs> awful. <laughs> but um, again, uh, so because of the way those work, we often have a lot of sort of secret objectives and sort of hidden information. Um, and that makes it amazing in terms of the payoff of getting to reveal all of these in, right. these little bits. The problem with that is it means that uh, Nick and I, who play in those battles, really can't help Ken at all because if we know what's going on beforehand, it kind of takes right. away from it. And so Ken does, uh, does all of the, the planning and the setup and does. the design of these. Uh, I was not kidding when I said that Ken is like the real hero right. of the channel. Yeah, <laughs> but... So he does. He does all the planning for that, and that's often why it takes us so long to develop them. Because Ken's like, "Well, I got to work this all out on my own." So right. Yeah. 
Well, you know, and I think that's one of the things uh, about Armada that's so great is that, you know, it really lends itself to these amazing space battles. Because I know when the game, like, I know when the game first came out, there was this big problem, you know, it was a 300 point limit. And, and you never, I never felt like I was playing an Armada. I, f I was reading a couple of sci-fi books at the time and they were talking about these little flotillas of like four and five ships, you know, and I'm like, that feels like I'm flying three or four ships. So I don't even have like less than a flotilla with my, you know, two victories <laughs> and a gladiator. You know, it was, it was never, you know, I never felt that epic. And it's like now, you know, that we have so much more, especially with the inclusion of the ISD and, you know, mm. some of your Moncal ships. And, you know, as the game has grown it, you, and, you know, and as your collections grow, and for those of us who've been playing for a while that have multiples of, of multiple of ships, everything. we can you can put yeah. a thousand point list together or more, which, um, which actually kind of lends itself to what's coming next with the Super Star Destroyer. So... What was what was your reaction when they finally showed the uh, the Super Star Destroyer? I mean, it's really hard not to be awestruck by the model. Like when you see a model that's the size of a man's torso, it's hard <laughs> not to be like, "Holy hell, that yeah. is amazing!" Um, and it's you know, and having now seen close up photos, actually, I think they were your photos as well. Um, there were a lot. I put I put some up, but I know most of the other bloggers uh, and and you know and, and everybody who is is you know. I, Gosh, everything, everybody from like Can I Get Your Ship Out to a Steel Squadron mm. had them up there. To a lot of the, a lot of there were a lot. I I, I went look, looking for pictures and I'm like mine and those and all those look the same because it's right you know it was right there. So right. how can you not? Everybody walking by couldn't help but take pictures of it. No, and I think the close up showed as well. Like the level of detail and intricacy on the model is like it looks astounding. And I have to imagine in person it's even more impressive. Um, I mean, it's it's a gorgeous looking model, um, yeah, and that's, that's and I think that's gonna I think the the beauty of the model is gonna really escalate those those large games. So those large yes, scenarios yes. when you have, you know, ships as small as a Gazanti and a Raider alongside, you know, the the victories, and then the ISD, and then the even larger ship that it makes those smaller ships and even squadrons. Uh, really kind of shine with the comparison and the contrast there. So that much is going to be fun. It'd be nice if the Rebels had something too. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. I think uh, I think definitely the SSD will really lend an epic feeling to any game that it's in. Um, I do really like that they, I mean, at least from what I've heard, um, that they're making it tournament legal. I think that'll be really interesting. But what I like as well is, I mean, it just looks like it's going to be fantastic for narrative play. Like whether or not... Oh, yeah. It, FFG releases any special scenarios or campaign centered on it. I'm pretty sure that with a model like that, the community will begin developing amazing content. The, the, sort of... I mean, I know you guys will for sure. <laughs> Ken <laughs> probably already has three scenarios written for it. I, 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 I hadn't speculated because it was one of the things that I really, it was definitely on my wish list for Armada was a Super Star Destroyer from the, for the longest time. And, and I wanted it earlier. And I've even heard that it had been in, you know, been more in the pipe for years. So I guess it took mm. him a long time, but I, had it come out like, like years ago, then maybe we'd be due for our second huge ship by now, because now who knows how long it's going to be before. Again, well, this is a right. new class of ships, too, and, you know, and, that's, and that's really impressive, too, um, because of just how much um, you're able to get with, uh, with, you know, with just a whole new class. And, and there's a whole lot of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet, like what is, right. you know, how's Mahdi going to affect a huge ship, right? That's right. Um, how are you know how are ramming how's ramming gonna work can, can a whole bunch of cr90s with engine text just kill it or does it automatically get like hardened bulkheads or right know, or how are, you know how are all those upgrades that are like large ship only like is that eroded for huge ships or is that an excellent intentional point. excellent point. yeah I, I think there's gonna be a lot i think i think what will end up happening is it will probably be something like anything that includes large ship also includes huge huge ship Almost like where huge shit is a, like a well, huge ship is a, is a, a subset of uh, yeah, yeah wait wrong channel for um, yeah like like huge ship is a subset of uh, large ship like includes that and then some perhaps I don't, but I don't know I I think it's just gonna end up being an errata like uh, like all those mm. cards that were large ship only are probably just gonna probably gonna end up getting it but I you know I think it's really gonna re the biggest surprise I think to me with not that we were getting that, because I think a lot of people expected it. it. I didn't know when it was coming, but I definitely expected it. And even from last Gen Con, when they said something 
something huge was coming. Right. We all kind of thought, well, obviously that's what it was going to be. And I think they probably intended to have it out much sooner than now. But um, the biggest surprise for me was that there's two commanders that we're getting. We're getting um, mm. Piet and we're getting Palpatine. Palpatine. Which I was fine for them only having one you know, Imperial ship because the Rebels were always up one since the core set. They always had plus one more. So, and I was fine with that. The game doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical and there's enough variety in there at this point that it doesn't need to be. But having two more commanders and nothing for the Rebels that really kind of, I feel like that's going to throw the meta way out of whack for a while. You know? Yeah, I, I would say, look, I would say that's probably if I had any, uh, I guess, like dark cloud on the horizon for that. Um, I really do think that uh, like it's a gorgeous model and, you know, like for the, the hardcore players or the Imperial players, um, you're probably going to definitely end up getting it. But if you're just a rebel only player and, you know, and that shouldn't be that uncommon, you're probably sitting there going, all right, that's great. This is awesome. Where's my stuff? Yes, you know? absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So I don't know. I I really think that's something that FFG probably needs to consider because you know just leaving a faction out in the cold like that. It's I don't know. It's not the best. Well, it definitely isn't. And one of the things is we don't know how long it's going to be right. too. And because it, Armada is definitely by now, I think we've gotten over the I don't know maybe the honeymoon phase of this game where we were getting four ship waves. Even right. wave three and wave four were kind of. I don't know what was going on with that, but it was like, oh, these are two separate waves, but oh, but they come out on the same day. And so, you know, we, we, we were, we've gotten used to having more than two ships. Even Wave 7 was two ships, oh, and the Gauntlet Fighter. So there was a, some extra squadron play coming into the game at that point. So there was a little bit more than just two ships. But now we're getting less than two ships. And, and, that's, and that's really, you know, like... Is there going to be something maybe in like two or three months that gets announced? Or, you know, like there's a lot of questions. And I thought for sure it was going to be the Starhawk. Because right. if you've read the books, the Starhawks, you know, were the, la the latest rebel ship. And they brought down that Super Star Destroyer at Jakku. And, of course, that would have really worked. Because maybe the rebels didn't need a huge ship. But maybe they needed some more medium and I'm not sure if the Starhawk would be medium or large because it's really it's not even canonized for its appearance yet. So we're like we're also kind of curious what it looks like. But I thought that would have been great. Um, but I, I thought also would at least get some Rebel cards in here. And that's another thing too, like the upgrade cards. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything. And 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 I'm curious your take on this. It looks like they're giving you some like hard to find upgrades. Uh, right. Yeah. And and so stuff that maybe you would if you didn't want to have to buy another Victory expansion or something like that. You know that you can get it here, but again, that's still really nothing new for rebel players. Unless I don't know. I mean, maybe unless you were just rebels that didn't want to buy the victory. Well, now they definitely don't want to buy a, a super star <laughs> super destroyer. destroyer. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. Look, I really do think um, there needs to be more content for Armada. Like, especially if you're just releasing like one ship. Um. There's a lot of love for this game. It's probably, I mean, it, it's definitely my favorite game of the ones that we're covering. Um, and it's just such such a good mechanical game. And I think FFG just needs to show it that support that it deserves. Um, you know, it's it'd probably be hard for Rebel players not to feel a little, like, on, on the out, out, outer or, like, a little slighted, you know? Right. Because you have, it's hard for a community to get excited about it if not all members of the community are getting engaged by it. Um, I do think the upgrade card things are really a uh, sort of interesting thing. I think it's probably good, at least for the Imperial players, because I know so many that are like, but another victory, I don't want to buy that mm -hmm. just for this one card. Absolutely. Um, and I definitely think, I think that, um, and maybe this sort of segues into other topics and is now probably a good time to talk, talk about it. But, you know, I really do think that FFG's model that it sort of had with Armada of having those mm -hmm. you know, you know, generic upgrades that were, could be played cross faction and were really amazing cross faction but were only available in one ship. Yes. So for example like things like APTs being only available in the Mc30 mm. but obviously every gladiator wants to run APTs yep. at some point in their lifetime. Yeah. Spinal armament uh, only available in the Liberty and like and that's one that I really want a lot of. The spinal right. armament is number 1 on my list of cards that I really want a promo of. It used to be right. Turbo Laser Reroute Circuits. And I, I will, <laughs> the day I bought my fourth MC30, yep. just for the TRC, because I wanted to run yep. four CR98s, the day I bought that, they announced 
the article came out like a half an hour <laughs> later. I'm like, oh, by the way, the next quarter is we're giving out TRCs. And now I've got like eight of them. I've, actually, I had like 12 of them of the promos. And I would give them out to new players as they were coming in because I didn't need 12. Although now with the SSD, who knows what the higher point limit is going to be. So maybe right. I will need 12 at some point. Which, well, and, oh, sorry, you guys. No, no, I was going to say, which, is, which kind of makes me also... It could be a segue into higher point limit games too, and 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 I wonder how high they're going to go, or if there is going to be any official support for some of these, because this will be their first ship that presumably costs over four hundred points. So if mm. let, let's say, you know, they have an eight hundred point ship, as now thousand points going to be an official format. Will there be like Gen Con thousand point tournaments? You know, I mean, I think that would be really cool. And I would love to see that. I would love to because I think that leads itself into having bigger, more beautiful games, which is then going to attract people. Um, hopefully, there will be more product on the shelf, also, so people can actually buy the stuff. <laughs> That's one of the biggest problems. No, I definitely. Into. I really do think uh, I would be very surprised with the release of the SSD if we don't see. I still feel like they'll probably keep the four hundred point, uh, like sort of like you know the hardcore tournament sort of format. Sure. Um, and I feel like that's predominantly based off because so much of the game has been balanced around that. And so it would be difficult to, to shift that so late in the game. But what I do think you'll see is probably um, the creation of like an epic format, you know. Right, um, I think so. And like a higher points limit. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there will probably be um, support for both tournament style and like a big event game play for that. And I think that's really exciting because I think at those, you know, we've sort of got to explore that space a bit with our nerf heading, with those sort of scenarios that we've mm, done. Absolutely. And the higher point games are just, they're just very different. They're a very different style of play. Um, and I mean, they look amazing because like you say, you're not just like two ships and some squadrons on the table. You're like eight ships and like this cloud of fighters and it, yeah. you know, you put on the Star Wars music in the background and you're just sitting there going like, dun, 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 you know, having oh, a no, good it's, time. It's great. I, that's actually one of the things I wish they, like, I don't have many complaints about Armada. And I, I agree with you. It's definitely my favorite game, uh, at least out of tabletop games. I don't really mm. compare it to board games exactly. But, uh, but as far as tabletop games, it's my number one. Um, and probably by a significant margin, uh, mm. but but one of the things like and, and one of the reasons is because it's so balanced and I have so few complaints. But out of the you know out of the complaints, one is the you know the cost to entry. Hopefully someday there's a cheaper core set or an essentials kit. But I think the other thing is I wish there was a way to speed up those epic games a little bit. And mm. I know squadrons is one thing that some people complain about is the way that squadrons were implemented. And sometimes, like a lot of X-wing players who are used to very, very, very precise movements, see people picking up squadrons and putting them back down, and that drives people crazy. And um, or just you know the way that they can clutter up, like you know, 100 points of Tie Fighters can totally you know take up your battlefield. And now things it gets very clunky. And I would I, I would love there's a game called um, Star Trek. Uh, Ascendancy. Right. And one of the things you can do in that game is you can take like have one miniature represent like like six other squadrons or something like that. And so if you could have like maybe a, a squadron group uh, that right. would be represented by like a token, and that's these over here. Now they all move and attack together. It's still the same number of dice, but it takes up like it you know it's one sixth the the movement. So the that time. would really speed up you know at least it, maybe it was if that was an option for like epic only or something right. like that might be a fun you know. Well, because I think, I just think as well with the, the point about squadrons, uh, one of the other real time killers for squadrons with the way they're implemented is all of the overlapping auras that people sort of have to keep in check. Like, am I in tour and far range? Am I in 10 num range? Am I in, like, am, am I in range to, for yarn ores and escort? Mm -hmm. And so you see people trying to get this perfect precise placement well, because they have to be within range the, of... Who was the ores that you said? Jan Ors. I've never heard anybody say Jan before. That's. I wonder if that's a cultural thing. Wow. No. Yeah. And, and what's what? And what do you? How do you call the uh, the head hunter? What's the nomenclature for that? Uh, 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 the Z ninety five. Of course. No. No. That's yeah. But uh, you're in Australia, so I can't fault you for that. But uh, yeah. Well, that must be really. It would be really um, what xenophobic for me to do that. I think that's the right. Term. No. It's just it's just funny noticing little cultural differences. Um, because well, we, we do it, we call it Z we over here. And, well, I'm aware, and yeah. we definitely we get that on our channel. Uh, weirdly, mostly for Legion, because obviously with the Z6, it oh, comes up all the very, time. Yeah, and one then of the best, so we've one had, of the best cards in that game. Oh, oh, 
It's, 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 it's so stupid. That one guy up. rolls more than a full uh, <laughs> thing of stormtroopers combined, yeah. yeah speaking, um, so speaking of Legion, um, you guys have been covering Legion a lot more. How are you liking the game? I really like Legion. Um, so what's been great for me is so my entry to tabletop gaming was originally through the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game. That was my first experience way back in the day. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. um, and so that was like... Um, that like was Wizards my, of the my Coast, first... wasn't it? No, 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 no. Games Workshop. Oh, back, Games Workshop. Uh, oh, that's right. So you Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but the huge problem that I had with a lot of tabletop gaming is that I had the classic gray model syndrome where nothing was really super painted all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so Legion's the first time where I've really sat down properly and painted a whole army and getting a painted army on a table with all the terrain, it, it's just beautiful and it's such a fun experience. Yeah. And I think because because you've had to put the work in yourself a lot of the time, it's such a rewarding experience because when you have like this scene where like, you know, the rebel troopers are stacked up against a wall and you're like, those are my boys right yes. there. Yeah. You feel a little um, bit of, you feel like you've, you've contributed to them and that they're wearing yes. your colors. And so you, That's care, right. you feel emotionally invested in the battle. Correct. Yes. Um, which, which makes it amazing. Um, in terms of the gameplay, I really enjoy the gameplay a lot. Um, so I think one of the things that I prefer about it over Armada is the fact that um, the uh, like killing enemy things, enemy squads, is not directly tied to winning the game. Like It will help you, obviously, yes. if you're beating the crap out of your opponent. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, the objectives are quite distinct from just killing your opponent. And uh, what I like about that is, you know, in most of FFG's other competitive games, like obviously Armada, Imperial Assault, um, and, well, not so much Imperial Assault, but you, you get the idea. Sure. Winning is very much tied to killing your opponent normally. Um, and I like that in Legion, you can be getting the absolute snot, you know, kicked out of you, but because you're one guy hung on at the right point at the right time, you win the game because Absolutely. he's got the objective and that's all that matters. Yes, um, I, I, I actually makes me kind of wish that Armada had a few more objectives, and that's something that they can easily add to. But that mm-hmm. were that were more you know strategy dependent and and you know more clutch objectives that were because and a lot of times you can just say you know what screw it I'm not flying through those asteroids to pick up the objective token I'm just going to ignore the objective and try to table you. When that and honestly I've played a lot of games of Legion and I don't think anybody's ever been maybe one time was somebody actually tabled. And it, right. just, it just doesn't happen. It's 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 always objective focused. It's like the rebels aren't going to actually blow up the Death Star, but they just have to capture the plans. You know, they right, have, to have exactly. one guy make it out with those plans, and they can win. And that's and no. that makes it more thematic. No, and I love that. And what I also so it's something that I love about Legion, and I also hate about Legion is so at least currently with where it is in yeah. like in its current game state. Um, so most people tend to talk about with games, there's uh, sort of two linked things. So you have the sort of the level of skill involved and the level of variance, like luck um, sort of right. attribute. Um, Legion has a lot more variance right now, and that comes from the lack of dice modification powers and things like that. And so what's great about that is you can't really predict it in the same way. Like you're working with averages as you are with any sort of game, but mm-hmm. there's a lot more swing to it. Um, and that's great and terrible at the same time because it's great because it leads to these fantastic moments and you know you know like never tell me the odds right right but then it also can be terrible because then you sometimes you just get diced and that's awful (laughs) there is and also the fact that you have defense dice too and that was one of the draws for armada is that you still have some dice and so there's still an element of luck like i could roll you know, all double hits with a Psy Moon at a clutch time and, and, you know, and completely, you know, kill your flagship that maybe had full shields or whatever. But the chances were it's slim. But for defense, you had to choose. You had to make those choices. And mm-hmm. I came from X-Wing, and X-Wing was very, very much dice dependent for a while and slowly started to get more dice control. Um, but once they started introducing these cards that you could, you know, you have to choose. This is a one-time thing. You have to choose when you do it. And so it started giving you a choice instead of just rolling dice. Um, that made me really, really like that aspect in Armada. And so that was one of the things I would tell X-Wing players who were asking questions about Armada. I'm like, well, if, you know, like that sh- card crack shot, and you have to choose when to do that? It's like that for defense. You have to choose, do I brace now against only two damage, or do I expect mm-hmm. four damage later? And there's really not much of that in Legion, and that's one thing that would be nicer uh, to have those, you know, those, those hard defense 
things. Totally. I, I definitely would say that if someone was to ask me what are your two favorite things about Amada, my first my first point would be the maneuver tool because I think it's such a lovely and elegant system. And my second would be the defense token system. Right. Because as you say, I, I like the fact that, I don't know why it's different, but at least on defense, uh, it always feels nicer that at the end of the day, everything's in your control, right? You know, you make a choice, as you said, about when to brace or when to contain or when to redirect. And a lot of the time, if you've made the wrong call, you die. But at least you know it's your fault, if that makes sense. Like, the, the onus is on you. Right. Where, you, you're where not going to have as many times where you have to dice shame. Although, you, yes. you can. You can. <laughs> I, 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 played, um, I played JJ's Juggernaut at Dice Tower, and that was, like, the highest level player I have, I have played. And I, so I was all excited, and, uh, and so we got ready to play. And it was late, and, and I was running mm. Vader with Architons, and every he, he, I had his flagship down to one hit point left at the end of the game. But I thought about every single time, when I, you know, we were talking about you go back and rewatch these gameplays. Every time I vadered, I had a worse role than had I just not vadered <laughs> at all. Um, every single time. So, like, if I had no commander and just ate the 36 points or whatever, I, you know, am, I might have won. Or at least it might have been like a 6-5 or something like that. Um, you know, and so, so that's, you know, I guess that could be a good thing about Legion, too, is usually as a unit gets weaker... Um, it gets actually weaker. So as uh, you know, your I start shooting your stormtroopers. You you can you have less dice available to throw back at me. Whereas right. in, you, typically in Armada, a, a star destroyer with one hull left is just, just as strong. Design. I mean, mm -hmm. there are crits, so there's a little bit of that. You might have some criticals that have weakened right. you, but but I think my favorite thing about Legion is the the terrain, and mm. and, and and it's ironic to me because. This was Legion was my first t tabletop game in the 40k style that used terrain. I played right. Rune Wars a little bit, but Rune Wars had flat terrain like pieces of cardboard. Yeah, the little and cardboard. They were, it was basically like asteroids, you know. Right, um, exactly. So there wasn't really terrain, but mm. but this one actually really has terrain and true line of sight, and and it was my first game like that, and it it really it got me into building terrain. I started doing some videos oh. where I was building terrain, and I've even had some. You know, some people send me stuff to review, and that's really cool too. So I'm I'm loving the fact that I'm playing a 3D game on a right. 2D surface, and so that is. And the irony there is that the games that really should be 3D, like X-Wing and Armada and the space games, <laughs> right. are just totally flat. It's like I'm playing a boat game, you know. So, <laughs> so that's and I and I wonder, and it, which has made me wonder sometimes, like, what if FFG were to take the Armada system and apply it to like a boat game? And mm. you know, it's maybe one of their own IP because they have Terranoth, like Rune Wars world, right? You know, right. like, and it makes me think, would I want to play that? Like, I'd have a hard time investing in a whole new game at this point. But mm. the idea that maybe they could release product faster because I don't know how much of the delay uh, deals with licensor approval or not. Right. You know, exactly. I, I I don't know how much, but because Rune Wars, I don't I don't know how how good Rune Wars is doing. It doesn't seem. Like it's really doing that well, but they're still releasing products like nonstop, and I guess they probably. They, they, I'm guessing they make more money off of that since they don't have to pay somebody else, you know, a percentage of every box that gets stolen, so so they can or, or sold, not stolen. <laughs> but but yeah, so I mean, I, I I like the system, and that's one of the things that really helps too, because I love the IP. You know, I mean, I mm. think uh, who's not a Star Wars fan that plays these games, right? Uh, you know, so having the IP there is great, but then when the system is just really really good underneath. So it makes for a really sweet, um, a sweet so, experience. So, so I think, yeah, I, look, I think that's a really interesting point because, yeah, my understanding with Rune Wars is because, um, like, like your experiences, it hasn't really taken off here. Mm -hmm. um, but FFG is a lot happier to release this, like, you know, this this quick bang content. Um, and my understanding is not only is it easier because they don't have to get licensing approval, but as you say, they're not having to meet a certain amount of sales to pay for the licensing, um, you know, for that release. So they can release, you know, they can release a, a new unit and it can sell like much less stock, but because they don't have to meet licensing fees, right. it actually makes them a lot more profit. So it's a lot easier for them to do. And it's also so just more stuff that they can say, oh, well, it's Friday. We need a, a new article. Oh, what's well, so great. We oh, have, we have right. 12 things in the pipe for this. Oh, okay. Well, we'll go with, we can fall back to that. Another thing I've Rune Wars too is that they can release so much stuff because they have more factions. So they've right. got all these other factions. Speak, and which, which is a kind of a segue into one of my most anticipated topics right now is Clone Wars for Armada. Right. I don't know what your opinion is on the Clone Wars or on getting that on Armada. So 
what are your thoughts? Would you are you hoping to see Clone Wars come to Armada at some point? I really am. Um, uh, like, so the thing was is so obviously it was a bit conspicuous uh, with the Clone Wars announcement that right. that Armada wasn't included, and I don't know. I'm kind of really. Um, I guess my initial thoughts on that lack of inclusion will probably be negative because either they are planning on eventually bringing Clone Wars to Armada, but they haven't really got as much in the pipeline as they do for X-Wing and Legion. Right. So they haven't put it on the announcement chain. And if that's their plan, if they're ultimately planning to bring Clone Wars to Armada, I really just think they should have included the Armada logo in there anyway, because if it's part of your plan, it just generates excitement. Like knowing like it, right. it, at some point in the future, Clone Wars is coming is exciting. Um, and if they're not planning on bringing Clone Wars to Armada, I think that's a really big missed opportunity because there's so much fertile content for Armada, especially. So much. And and a lot of it, they could, a lot of those ships are really big, like the Lucra Hulk or mm. the Malevolence or, you know, and now that they have huge ships, uh, there's there's so much for the Separatists that, that are, you know, that are, they're going to draw a pretty high price point. Uh, in addition to all their, you know, the regular, you know, um, cruisers and everything like that. But uh, yeah, there, everything, there's so much content that's just, totally ready for ready to go like the game it, it sells itself you know that's right yeah it, it, there's you, i mean and there's so many people right now in their 20s uh that you know grew up with the clone wars and now have jobs and have disposable income and to them that was their first star wars and Ooh. like demoing armada at all these conventions you know is one of, the, one of the things people ask me quite a bit and i've had so many people come up to me and say like man if they had clone wars for this game i would be in it in a heartbeat and i'm like well i wish i could tell you they they you know, that i had it in the plan but i i think what's likely is that they probably wanted to see how um like it, it it's one thing to say that there's a lot of people that are ready to jump into this game and it's another thing to actually mm -hmm. have the sales because there's so many times where I've heard, like, I'm a big Thundercats fan. It was my favorite cartoon from the 80s. And there's right. one of the things that, that that IP suffers from is fans beg for a product, and then when it comes out, they don't buy it. So manufacturers yeah. make all this stuff, and then it just sits on a, you know, sits in a warehouse. So I think it's probably more of a proof of concept at this point that, uh, you know, look, X-Wing is, like, really, really popular. It's mm -hmm. well, one of the most popular uh, miniatures games in, uh, you know, in the world, as far as I know right now. It's, it's, it's up there. And mm -hmm. so you, you, can, you can take that risk because that game is such a big deal that even if people aren't that crazy about Clone Wars, they'll probably still buy it because there's a lot of completionists. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to buy everything for X-Wing for the Clone Wars. And if I'm not even that big of a fan of a faction, that means I'll probably just buy one of each thing. You know, if, if nothing else, at least to review it and to have it on my shelf because they're amazing looking models. Same goes for Legion. Uh, I really mm. am looking forward to a Gungan army in Legion. But I think Legion is doing really, really well right now. Uh, better than maybe they even expected, which is great because I think they were appealing to a whole different audience with, with the 40K crowd as well as mm -hmm. all of their existing customer base. But, uh, but I think Armada, because it's, you know, it's a, it's a slower game, uh, that that they're probably like, well, let's see how much people are going to go crazy for Clone Wars, and then if it then proves decide. itself, then we'll go ahead and go forward. That's my expectation, but uh, you know, I'm definitely. Uh, do you have a, a preference of uh, a Republic or a Separatists? Uh, oh, Republic. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Republic boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that's a valid point, and obviously, you know, it's very easy to like armchair quarterback like these huge business decisions. Like, well, if FFG just did this and this and this. They would, oh, it would sell like crazy because oh, here's my degree in like just sitting here and never running a company at every stage of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I, I guess my main concern sort of with um, while that makes a lot of um, business sense, I guess as a community person, obviously my bias and perspective is from the community. And I think, um, you know, I think FFG really does need to show a bit more love. Um, I, I know, I know like, like, well, you just got an SSD announced. Like, how can you be you know, feeling unloved. But I really do think that there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot more effort that could be put into Armada. And I think the concern is, is that, um, you know, you have the, the classic Armada is dead meme, which I, I don't be believe at all. But No, no, it, it's, it, it started a long time. And I was actually, I'm going to admit something to you. I was one of the people who I think inadvertently helped start that. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was at a time when, there was a full year and no news when the game was still young. And that was, mm. they announced the, the Star Destroyer and all of Wave 2 way too early. And, yes. and 
well, I, I can say that now, but maybe it wasn't because that was the one thing that made me actually dive into Armada. I wasn't really sure I was going to play it because I was playing X-Wing at the time. I'm like, I don't want two spaceship games. Then I saw that that's ISD and I'm like, oh, that's that's beautiful. All right, all right, I'll, I'll try this game out. So I bought the core <laughs> set and then bought all the Wave 1. And then I actually got my ISD and home one early in those pre-release tournaments. The right, Massing the, at Solace. Massing at yeah. Because mm-hmm. I went to two, and I placed second in both of them, but the same person won first in both of them, so we kind of worked a deal. Um, nice. Yeah, it was it was great. But uh, and, and so that would actually let me get. But so so I had my stuff really early, and I was sitting there for so long. So then when Wave Two finally came out, I was really no big no new ships for me to go to, to go buy because I had a friend who had a Raider and a friend who had an MC-30 so I got to basically see everything ahead of time I got to do what they let me do their unboxings and everything too so um, but from the day that they announced the you know the, the that wave two of Armada earliest and they spoiled like those pictures from it to the day that we got like that wave three announcement I think it was like 14 months or something like that it was a really long it was time. a long time yeah, and so there was, you know, and there was, a, so naturally you go that long with a game that's still new, people are mm. going to think there's something, there's something fishy going on. So, uh, but I did also publicly apologize. Once Wave 3 and 4 both were, were announced, I was like, all right, <laughs> especially when that Liberty showed up, we're like, oh man, that was, that was like, all right. And, and, and it wasn't long after that that I think the game got to a comfortable spot because that's the problem that Legion has had um, recently is that like, how many games can you play before you realize you're just playing the same list over and over, over, again? And over again? Right, yeah. totally. I mean, the, the amount of times, because I'm playing Mono Faction in Legion because I just didn't want to paint that many things. Um, and the amount of times, like, I'm sitting there and I was saying, you know, com- my commandos are sitting on my desk. And I'm so happy because the amount of, like, Luke Leia, four to five trooper units and <laughs> yep. some ATRT lists that I've played is too damn high. And you just... You sort of sitting at it. You start to get to a point. You're like, "All right, this is great. I'm having fun. I feel like I'm running the same five miles over and over yeah. again." <laughs> I think uh, with what they announced too, with what everything that's coming now, we're gonna have, um, you know, I think both factions now have a second special forces option that's that's been announced. So mm-hmm. by the time that comes out, we're gonna have multiple options for everything. We're gonna have multiple, well, everything except heavy, because we're gonna have multiple support options with the e webs and the. The, the the turrets for the rebels. Um, you're gonna have multiple special forces options. You're gonna have uh, an operative as well as three commanders per faction by the time Palpatine yeah. comes out. So that's really gonna give you some list diversity, and I think the game will be at a comfortable point. And definitely, and maybe, yeah. And that and that that's probably where the those two factions need to be before Clone Wars can come out. Uh, and, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think at that point you're talking about where. Especially in a in a game like Legion, where you have those different like roles, like you have the cores, you have your leaders, and things like that, you really need multiple options in each sort of category. Heavy, not in, not not including, because that's kind of almost like a special category, really. But um, I would like to see multiple options for oh, that as well. Definitely, I'd love to uh, see an ad at at some point. I just I don't. Right. I've played the game enough to say like I don't think it could really work, but right, even right. maybe one that's just static, like, like yeah. it's powered off. Right, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't move. But. Right, but I think when you're at that point where you have those multiple options, really, I think that's the point where you can say, okay, th- the game is now in its mature state for the first time, because there's enough options here for list diversity. The meta will be varied at least for a while, um, and I think you're right. That's a good point for new factions to be released, because if the existing factions aren't like rounded out, it's going to feel a bit, you know, awkward if you suddenly put them on hold to release new stuff. Yeah. I think, and I think that's I think they've learned their lesson with with Legion, and that's one of the things that's good when you when you've played a number of FFG games. You see, each game has a lot of little things that they improve on from game to game. My mm. biggest, my only complaint right now is I wish they wouldn't have these staggered releases. I'm like, why are we yeah. getting Han and the other Rebel? Unit? Like, I would rather have Han and Boba at the same time, and then right. you know, Special Forces and Special Forces at the same time. This way. Because now it's going to be like two months of everybody's running rebels because the empire doesn't have any special forces, you know? right? And that's I'm like, oh come on, guys, you can do. And and I think this stems from somebody, whether it's somebody in marketing or whatever, said something. They made a promise that there was going to be at least one expansion every month for the first full year of Legion. Mm. And I'm like, and there, and someone's like, well, how do we do that? Well, I know we just we take a whole wave and instead of releasing the wave. We're just going to break just it split up. It. Yeah. And, and it was split at the wrong part, but I don't know. I mean, 
I, again, I have no idea how printing and manufacturing and all of you know the steps in the chain actually have their own complexities. So uh, I, I can only speculate, but it's kind of fun to speculate sometimes, you know. I mean, no, we're, it is. we're in the media and we talk to people, and that's what the community likes to do. You're sitting around, you know, at a game store, and everybody's shooting the breeze, and you speculate. And it's, it's kinda, no, totally. Yeah. And I definitely think that's a really good point because um, it definitely was one of my concerns uh, when sort of the release cycle for Legion, at least initially, as you say, for this first twelve month period, was sort of revealed to me. Uh, I do think it creates some problems, especially, again, for mono-faction players, where it kind of creates uh, not an imbalance in terms of, like, one one faction becomes overpowered, but it creates this imbalance in terms of available options, where, you know, like, now that the Rebels have, you know, Han and the Commandos released, if you're just an Imperial-only player, you're sitting there, like, you know, drumming your fingers on the table, like, cool, this is great, I'm really glad you have all these new toys, and yeah. I have nothing, and, oh, yeah. and you're kicking my butt with these new toys? When are Bobba and the Scouts releasing? You know, whereas exactly. as you say, if they'd done it as Han and Bobba, you'd be sitting there going, you know, the Rebel guys painting Han, the Imperial guys painting Bobba, and then you meet on the table and you you duke it out. Mm -hmm. and you and have, even you that both has its asymmetry because uh, Boba's an operative, and of course we're right. not getting the first Rebel operative until Chewie, but but that's okay. And again, the factions don't have to be perfectly symmetric, uh, but mm. it, but having options, I think the options need to be be there. And and that's like one good thing though, like you said before about Legion is is the you are you're not stuck to buying both factions. Uh, totally, I think, I think they've done a good job as far as value to in the core set. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I tell somebody you for one core set you can be playing an 800 point game if you split with that core set with another person. You know, there's enough or or if you're gonna play both factions, the two core sets gives you enough to you know you have so many units. You've got your commander, mm -hmm. you got two core units, and then. You're getting like four different units. I'm like, I wish the Armada Corps set had like. You look at what the Imperial player. Oh, you have one ship. You know. Yep. I mean, you get some uh, squadrons in there too. But I like. Uh, I wish. I would love to see a new Armada Corps set. I definitely think so, and I, I think it's overdue as well because the the contents of the Armada Corps set now um, it's it's not the same. Um, like when when the game was released, you're like, cool, I've got this victory, and it looks great, and you have the Rebel stuff, and it felt great. Whereas now, it kind of when you look at the wider release options, you sort of looking at the victory, especially like for Imperial players, and you're like, why do I want this dinky ship when I have the ISD available? Yes, um, it's and, it, and it's they've to in their defense, they've worked to make the victory well the victory two at least a lot better, uh, and it certainly mm. has improved over the you know with each wave actually for the past two or three waves, it's gotten better and better, but you know it's still not that great, you know, and it's but and that's actually a really good problem to have is like maybe. You could make an argument that maybe the Victory One is the worst ship in the game. Maybe mm. you know. I, I think I think I think there's an argument to be made there, but it's still not that bad. It's still playable, and you can still oh, win definitely. with it. You know, and so like, when your worst ship is still a viable ship, the game is in a good spot. You know, totally. I mean, you look at Worlds, and you know, like uh, top top five on one of the days was a Victory One, um, and so you're right. There's very few like. There's things that are less good, shall we say, and there's, or at least, you know, depending on your play style and things like that, but there's very few things that, you know, universally you're like, oh, that's garbage. Don't, <laughs> don't buy it. Don't pick it up. That's very awful. Few. That's very few. Yeah. I see, um, sometimes is, I joke around and I say that uh, Ozil is garbage, but that's just, that's just me. Well, I mean, that's just me not wrong, wanting to do that. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to stick by that opinion until it changes, but, uh, you know, I reserve the right to have my own bias as well. I'm just not a fan of the NAV command, but... That's oh, just, you, me. Just... you know, oh, I, I'm going to tell you, I, we, we've been talking about this uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the Discord and on the forums mm -hmm. a little bit. From my games, in, and I'm going to say roughly 100% of my games, I, I have a plan of how the whole thing from setup, once I set that speed, that's the speed I want to be the whole game. Sometimes I will do a nav just to slow down a little bit or speed up a little bit. But like I'm like I'd say I'm gonna go from here to here, and that's exactly what I do. I don't ever want to change my speed that much, so I very very seldom nav. And a lot of that I think has to do with the fact that I tend to fly Architans or conga line ships uh, or mm. broadside arc ships. So I'm going this way. I'm going away from you, and mm -hmm. you know as you get closer, like even if you speed up and get closer to me, like it's very easy to keep a whole bunch of broadside ships like targeted. But then again. I think one of the things you run into is is that different areas and their local meta are influencing each other in all these microcosms. And so if if I ran, you know, against some of the people that that 
do lots of nav. I might be like, wow, okay, nav is more powerful because nor one of the reasons I don't nav might be because other people don't nav either. And so we both just say, we're just going to duke it out. And we're just going to, you know, we're just going to do this over and over again. And, and in that type of meta, maybe nav wouldn't be that useful. Or, you know, and it's the same thing with people running squadronless. There's more and more people now running squadronless than I've ever seen before. And like a year ago, you know, you say you're going to run squadronless, you get laughed out of the store or, you know, or, you know that I mean, that was, it wasn't, you know, it hardly ever happened. But now, you know, I, and I think it has a lot to do with, um, with uh, Sloan. I think, mm. you know, like Sloan elevated squadrons to this point where now everybody's just like, well, I just need to have a list that completely destroys squadrons. So then they're like, well, the counter to that is I'm not, surprise, surprise, I brought zero, you know, and, mm. and the flotilla rule really helped. Uh, the relay nerf and all of that at that last FAQ, uh, I think really, you know, just changed squadrons such that, you know, now maybe you can get away with running squadrons, squadron less. Well, I say maybe you can, but I mean, it happens quite a bit. Uh, Gen Con winner just you know JJ just ran without squadrons and you know managed to pull out a win there too so you know it can it can definitely happen but if you're running up against a lot of heavy bomber lists in your in your area you're gonna have to do more uh, you're gonna you're gonna have to have more of a squadron defense and so I think that's why I feel that way about certain commanders but I also look at other bad <laughs> commanders and I try to like view that as a challenge like uh, I'm running in a tournament tomorrow and I'm probably gonna run tag. And I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to win it. You know, it's only a two round tournament, so a small. You know, basically, a, you know, a, like a, a mini tournament. But I, th I think I can do it. I think I think it, and, it, and I like the challenge of it. That's why I run Akbar Nebulons from time to time. You know, I could take something <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, you know, but I play more for fun than than to win. I don't you know I don't necessarily mm. play to win. If I if I can lose, but I can make tag work in the process. Mm. Like I lost, but dude, did you see that? That was awesome. I can walk away from that game with. You know, with a smile on my face, at least. That's I don't know. Uh, that's my. I think everybody has their own. Um, oh, definitely. Look, and that balance. A lot of it comes down to sort of like you know to get real deep into it. A lot of it comes down to like the psychographic of the player, right? Like what your player type is, like what where you derive enjoyment from games. Um, I'll probably just focus on Nav because there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack from that. Uh, <laughs> I, I I did just kind of just like here. here. Here's all of this stuff. Here, I'm going to... Oh, there we go. That was uh, it. Yeah, that's it. All right, all right. What are your thoughts on yeah, this 55 uh, deck? That was actually a couple of Keyforge decks I just dumped out, which was kind of dumb because they're, they're <laughs> unique and you can't get the... All right. But yes, uh, um, so, so, so Nav. Um, so I, I'm, I I'm in the complete opposite camp. Uh, Navigate, for me, I think is the most important command in the game. Um, but I guess, again, that's, that's a difference of play style. Um, I think navigating is very important because um, really it allows you to control so many aspects of the game. It allows you to control uh, what's getting hit, uh, where it's getting hit, the amount of dice that are being thrown at it. Uh, you know, if you can navigate at the right time and position yourself in a good arc for you and a bad arc for your opponent, you're maximizing your advantage because you're throwing more dice on target than your opponent. Um, or similarly, you know, a lot of the real uh, tricks, not tricks, like sort of the strategies, um, that we've talked about in our videos with the captain's clinic, uh, like blocking and things like that, they really do require you to navigate a lot. Um, and I, I really do think um, there, uh, my position is default that if you don't know what you want to be doing on a turn, you should just be navigating because it, it gives you so much flexibility in terms of being able to look at the state of the battlefield and say, okay, I need to speed up and get out of here or, I, or get closer to my enemy or I need to slow down and avoid certain things or move, move in a different way, turn hard, things like that. And, and I, think, I think from that argument too, like not to disagree with you, but rather to agree with you, I think Ozil trying to be objective, and it's hard to be objective when you're as biased as I am, but uh, <laughs> I, think, I think him giving you the option of changing your speed by even more um, is... is can be very very helpful especially to somebody who's still learning the game too that doesn't maybe know exactly where they're going to need to end up and it's you know and, and now they're during the determined course step they be like oh i could go here or i could go all the way up to speed four and i could be out of your range completely now you don't get no shot on me at all uh, you know mm. and so like having those options is great and for his point cost i will give you uh, that ozel is actually 
the cheapest Imperial Commander, too, so he frees up room for other upgrades or maybe a whole other ship, whereas Vader costs almost double, you know. And mm. so, you know, th- 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 there's definitely some, there, there's value to be had. And so I joke around when I say that he's he's crap or, or whatever, and I don't really mean that. He's just, the, the truth is he doesn't suit my play style because I am Correct. I am a chaos player. If like I, I really like the randomness of the dice, and I really like having just that one extra, even on a Simon. At mm. long range, that one extra because it might be a double, and it might be that one extra damage that that pushes me over, you know, um, you know, you know, and so so and and so when it is when it when that one die does matter, it's so immensely satisfying, and so I, I live for those moments. But that's my own personal play style. So I like I joke around about the other stuff. Nav is very very important, and you're absolutely right. If you can navigate out of that front arc of that star destroyer and just be in the side arc. Mm. tremendous benefit there and that's 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 game-winning tactics um you know yeah and i i i think it's interesting so um where you say like you're a chaos player i wouldn't say necessarily that i'm a control player but um i i do one of the main benefits of navigating compared to say like dice is that the result is quite often certain if you're if you've moved in a particular way and it's put you in a particular position, mm-hmm. barring obviously your enemy then moving, mm-hmm. the result of that move is certain. Whereas comparing where you're saying you're adding in a dice, the result is uncertain, and the result can be fantastic if, you, as you say, you roll a double, or you could roll a blank. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I sort of I definitely I I actually really feel uh, Ozil is great because, um, and I like all of the movement based commanders, but so where you talk about Ozil's great because. And I definitely agree. I think he is good for, for new players because he gives you so much flexibility. But what's interesting is I think that flexibility isn't just limited to new players because once you know what you're doing, having the flexibility of being practically any way you want, when you know what you're doing, any way you want is normally lethal to your opponent. That's a, because fair, you that's can, a fair point. Because you can put it in such a position that it's like, well, I uh, put this here and uh, checkmate. <laughs> That's, that's not a bad I, I really can't argue with that to be honest with you I can't argue with that I, I do I do attract a lot of new players to this channel so that's one of the things I will focus a lot of things on and it's and it's hard when I have my own bias too because I don't want to tell everybody out there that Ozil is crap I don't I don't think I have any videos really saying I although I might have ranked him <laughs> kind of low in some of my ship well you do now I do uh, now, Ozil is yeah. crap the but title that, of <laughs> but but so I want to preface this if you're a newer player and and this is one of their first videos Ozil being crap is only my personal preference. Right. He is actually worth your time. So try him out and 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 check out some of the other blogs and some of the other because there's other people that have written more about him and that have talked more about him than I have and can give you, you know, there's and there's a lot of outlets for that. So definitely look into Ozil, but Vader is probably, you know, so much better. <laughs> well, see, I but think it, really it, does, it does depend on the type of fleet you're running. If you're running black dice with ordnance experts, you definitely don't want or don't need Vader nearly as much. You know. I, th- I think it's a good segue into just sort of like a general rule. Um, <laughs> I-, I find that, um, as you say, when people like us or other community writers and things like that, they say something like, you know, like, like Targ is garbage, put him in the trash, or Ozzel's the worst, or why are you running Garm? Yeah. At the end of the day, that's an opinion. Now, uh, you know, we might have arguments as to why we think that's valid, and, you know, we may be able to present data like, well... At all of these tournaments, he was very rarely taken, or if he was, he placed poorly, or, or whatever. But I actually think what's really important is, um, as a new player or even as an experienced player, when people have opinions, you should respect them because often they're coming from a place of, this is my experience, and I often have good reason to believe that this experience is good. But I think you should also sort of like verify and check, right? You know, if right. you hear like, you know, Targ is awful or something like that, maybe you should say, okay, there's probably good reason to believe this, but at the end of the day, I think you should try it and see if you can't find something that works for your play style and confirm it before you agree with that position. Like, and sometimes that can be really quick. Like, if someone says, yep, Demolisher with like an ordnance upgrade and ordnance experts is fantastic, and you put that ship on the table, and I feel like after your first game, you'll be like, wow. They were right. Demolisher yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, no, that one, that one, yeah, that's that's a great example because that one is easily going to make a lot of money. It's going to do fantastic. Uh, no, uh, although, granted, you might have to try it twice because you might end up facing somebody with damage control officer and oh, I'm sorry, your crits, none of your crits worked. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or or uh, I, there's a guy uh, at my store who, who runs 
the same list like every tournament with very 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 small variations and he really had a double interdictor list with Constantine now Constantine is one of the ones that gets a lot of hate um, mm-hmm. and and I understand why he's definitely probably one of the hardest commanders to really make work but this guy actually made a lot of progress with Constantine it had a viable pretty good Constantine list and uh, you know and and one of the things that would drive me crazy is when you'd run that demolisher up on his fleet and he had the um, and it's, the name escapes me but you know the the close range uh, interdictor only upgrade that lets forces you to your opponent to re-roll dice. Oh, targeting scramblers. Targeting yep. scramblers, yes. And so there's nothing worse than like, all right, I got my ordinance experts. Oh, I got I got two crits on the from a demolisher on you. And you're like, no, 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 you don't. You know, re-roll them. Oh, and just regular hits. You know, so 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 <laughs> there, there, there's always there's always going to be an exception to every rule. Um, but and these aren't even rules. These are more. You're right. These are just opinions. And uh, I think my advice to people is, you know, try everything out. And if you find something that you're having fun with, mm-hmm. then you should. You know, continue to explore that and see if you can find a way. That's like what I why I'm trying to run Akbar Nebulons a lot lately. Is uh, that's the least efficient, you know, or one of the least efficient options with Akbar is with the Nebulon frigate. But but it does have a wide arc, so there are pros and cons with it. But because it's so unexpected, I find it really, I find it a challenge, and I find it a lot of fun. So I'll go to a tournament, not just not to be competitive, because but because tournaments are occasions where you get to play multiple games, and so Ooh. being able to play multiple games in the same day is like a real treat because I have three kids so I don't get to go out like multiple times a week and play Armada so if I get one day I get to play twice I'm like yes let me bring a really fun list so that's one of the things I think having kids has really influenced my approach to games because I used Mm. to be a lot more competitive and now I'm a lot more like let's just go out and like if I can just socialize and we can laugh (laughs) and we can talk trash about oh did you see the last episode of Star Wars Rebels or whatever and, Mm -hmm. and things like that you know, I'm, I'm having a great time during the day. And if I'm playing a game that I'm like, I've got to win, I've got to win, it takes, oh, totally. it takes a lot away from me. You know, and I used to, I was playing Star Wars Destiny for a while and it was, it was very into a meta of win at all costs, you know, and, and I didn't, I just didn't really like that. And so I stopped playing it because I just like, I want to play, I want to have fun and I want everybody around me to have fun. I don't want people stressing out over, over stuff. So I think that's one of the things that approach that, that has definitely influenced my approach. So. No, and I definitely, I definitely agree. I think you know, at the end of the day, these are these are hobbies for us, right? Like we're not. It's not like you know, I'm going out to an Armada tournament, and I'm like, yep, you know, I'm a professional Armada player. This is how I make my pay. You know, like yeah. they're they're a hobby, and you know, hobbies should be at a base level enjoyable, and you should be having fun. And I think if you're finding yourself at a point where you're just I'm not having fun, then you should be thinking about like the reasons that are motivating you to play, sure. or whether you should even be playing like sometimes all you need is a break for a couple of weeks just to just to chill out and spend time with the family or loved ones and or friends in a non-gaming environment or things like that um so i really think you should always be thinking about you know well why am i coming to the table um and i definitely agree i think where you were talking about you know tournaments are really good testing beds because you get to go up against other players in the same day and you can sort of be like all right what worked, what didn't work. Um, and I think they're really valuable for that. And I definitely agree with what you were sort of saying earlier. I think, especially for new players, my advice to new players is when you first come in, you know, and you've had your demo game, try a couple of different lists and maybe get some advice from more experienced players about what they think could be good. And then once you find a fleet that sort of jives with your play style, play that fleet for like a while. Like just yeah, play that fleet definitely. and just tweak it. And then, because what that will do is it'll really it will increase your fundamental understanding of the game because you'll you'll get better with that list. You'll start to know how it works. And Excellent. then once you've got into the groove with a list, I find by the end of that period, you'll be an experienced player. And then from there, you can start trying like, well, let's do some wild stuff and try and make something work. And on top of that, it'll be easier on your wallet because you won't have to buy right. every other expansion that's out there. That's right. That's right. So um, I don't know how much more time you have, but I know we want to. Uh, I want to have a couple other non Armada and Legion questions, uh, like to kind of wrap things up too. Um, favorite Star Wars movie? Oh, tough goal. Um, overall, five individual sequence: Rogue One, Battle of uh, yeah. Battle of Scarif. Uh, when they come out of hyperspace. Oh, just, amazing. It's this, amazing. 
I, I loved it. that whole sequence in Rogue One. Uh, I like upon reflection, what I really enjoyed about it is like, especially the ground stuff, like the ground game in in Rogue One. Mm-hmm. Uh, it almost felt like you were watching like a like a war movie, except with lasers and Star Wars mm-hmm. rather than you know like World War Two or something. Yeah, absolutely. It was a lot. You could see, like, especially I think all of like the Vietnam style um, attire that, that these yes, guys definitely. were wearing too. It, 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 it pulled from all of that. Um, mm. favorite non-Star Wars uh, tabletop game or board game? Ooh, well, we can, ooh. well, those are two different questions, so let's go with board game. Board game, I'd say overall my favorite board game is Agricola. Okay. Uh, which is, uh, for those not familiar, is basically you're, it's a farming simulator, effectively. You're, uh, you're managing a like, 16th century farm. It sounds ridiculous. Like The first time I had it explained to me, and it's like, yeah, you're going to have this farm, but I'll tell you, the sheer joy of not having your people starve and getting like little sheep and cows on your farm is really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, something lighter, uh, I think Codenames is a really, really fantastic game. Yes, I, I, I do like the social games as well. More Ooh. so, not as big on the Euro games myself. I like anything that has <laughs> miniatures. I, I tend to, even board games, I want them usually to have miniatures. But um, And uh, I, think that's, um, I think that's about it. So uh, yeah, I think... With that, I want to thank you so much for for spending some time, taking some time out of your day to talk with me today. And uh, and and so, if people want to check out some of your stuff, where should they go? Uh, besides your YouTube channel, you have some. You guys have other sites as well, correct? Yeah. So obviously, so if you want to check us out on YouTube, uh, I think these days we're just called MOTF. We, I'll when put we a started link out down with, in the description as well. Yeah. When we started out with Amada, it was Master of the Fleet. I think whether or not we changed completely for Legion, we call ourselves Master of the Force. So one of those two will work. Um, I have a blog as well called Intel Sweep, which kind of covers a lot of Armada content, like particularly uh, sort of results from high-level tournaments and just general sort of things. I know Ken has one called Alpha Squadron, which covers a link sort of more into Legion and sort of his hobby journey there. Um, and you can check us out on Discord as well. We're just on the MOTF Discord, which if you go to our YouTube, there'll be links in our videos along there. All right, awesome. But, uh, but yeah, thank you for having me. It was great. It was really good. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for stopping by. And uh, you guys definitely check out Masters of the Fleet and Masters of the Force. And uh, is, are those two separate channels or is it on the same no, channel? No, it's, you it's changed the one channel. Header? So okay. we're just called MOTF now. Yeah. And we're going to have to work out what <laughs> the F stands for, I guess. <laughs> Masters of the Fun. The, the Fun. There oh, we go. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, it is pretty fun. You guys have a great attitude in your stuff. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching. And everybody, uh, thanks for tuning in and chatting with us. And I will, uh, we will talk to you guys later. So thank you so much for watching. And as always, have a great day.